mute yourself. Let's start uh, today's class. So today I'm going to talk about a topic on placenta. The placenta is a very important organ during pregnancy and placenta is the organ through which okay, blood will go to the baby. That is oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood is also received by placenta and then it will go towards the mother. So this is just one of the function of placenta. I'm just telling you the importance of placenta here. Okay, so let's start the class now. See here. Please mute yourself, okay? Do not make any noise. Do not, you know, disturb other people. Now, placenta permits the exchange of nutrients and waste products between the maternal and fetal circulation during the pregnancy. The baby is developing inside the uterus. That baby needs blood supply. The baby is producing a lot of waste things or waste products. Now that has to be exchanged and that is done by placenta. So without placenta, okay, the baby cannot grow inside the uterus. And the life of that baby there is impossible. Now look at this picture here. So this rounded structure is placenta, okay? This is umbilical cord which is attached to the surface of the placenta. And here is the baby. So see this, this umbilical cord is attached to the umbilicus of the baby. That's why the name. And on the other side, it is attached to the placenta. And this placenta is attached on the endometrium of the uterus. So this is how, you know, the connection between mother and baby is there inside the pregnancy, uh, inside the uterus during pregnancy. Now, a little bit, uh, you know, structurally, now see here. This is umbilical artery. So these are umbilical artery, we should say. There are two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. So this area, this structure is called umbilical cord. Okay. It is attached to the surface of the placenta. The umbilical cord is always attached to the fetal side of the placenta. Placenta has two component, maternal side or maternal component and the fetal side or fetal component. Now, maternal component is, is clear cut shown here. This is maternal component, okay? And this is the fetal one. Now, fetal component is mainly comprises of chorionic plate and chorion frondosum means whatever uh, structure is present on the outer surface of blastocyst. Remember that blastocyst, okay? The outer surface of blastocyst is the trophoblast. That trophoblast will differentiate into fetal component of the placenta. So here lots of chorionic villi will be formed. There is chorion membrane, there is amnion, okay? And on that side, uh, umbilical cord is also attached. Whereas on the other side, on the maternal side, okay, it is formed by decidua basalis. This is called decidua basalis. I'll talk about what is decidua. Now, I like to ask that question to you. What is decidua? Anybody can tell me? Yes, sir. Decidua is the uh, reaction in which uh, there is a uh, thickening and structure changes of the endometrium, formation of decidua, mainly for uh, implantation. Very good. He is absolutely correct. Okay, this is a new term for you because we have just started obstetrics. So, decidua is the change which has happened to the endometrium, okay, for the preparation of pregnancy. You just remember like this, very easy. It is the change which has happened to the endometrium, okay, so that whatever the baby need, the growing baby, Okay, that thing is provided by the decidua. So, uh, uh, one important hormone, which is called progesterone, is responsible for this deciduous change. Okay, this is also a type of secretory endometrium, but this is much more, you know, 
important than uh, secretory type of endometrium because we are talking about pregnancy now. This is decidua. So decidua is the changes which occur in endometrium of the uterus, okay, in response to the pregnancy. Another picture, all of you see here. This is umbilical cord, okay. Here is the umbilical cord. There are umbilical arteries and vein. Let me use the pointer and show you. This is umbilical cord. And these blue, blue are umbilical arteries and pink is the umbilical vein. Never forget that, okay. Because umbilical vein is taking the oxygenated, relatively oxygenated blood towards the baby. And then uh, these uh, uh, umbilical arteries are carrying the deoxygenated blood towards the placenta. So it's a bit of opposite because till now we have been talking about the veins carry deoxygenated blood and arteries are carrying oxygenated blood. It is a bit of a difference here. Now there are lots of maternal blood vessels. There are lots of fetal capillaries inside the placenta. So clearly you can see this is a fetal part of the placenta and this is the maternal part. The maternal part is formed by decidua basalis and the fetal part is formed by chorion frondosum. Now, the thing which I have been talking uh, is written here again, fetal component. The fetal component consists of chorionic plate and villi. Okay, chorionic plate and villi. And towards the fetal uh, component, towards the fetal component, the umbilical cord is attached. Now, it lies adjacent to the space near the endometrial decidua through which the maternal blood circulate. And this endometrial decidua forms the maternal component as well. So let's move further. Now, what are the okay, structure that form maternal component now? The maternal component is composed of decidua basalis. Isn't it from the beginning of the class? We are talking about that decidua basalis. This is the maternal component. Now, maternal blood vessels from the decidua they conduct blood into the intervillous space of the placenta, where the floating villi are present. These floating villi okay, help the flow of the blood towards the umbilical cord, and the blood will go to the baby through the umbilical vein. So see here, in decidua basalis, it's a part of the uterus itself, okay? So there are branches of uterine arteries there. That uterine arteries, okay, will bring the blood into the intervillous space of the placenta and that blood is collected by the umbilical vein and it will be taken towards the baby. So this is how the blood reaches the baby. So this is decidua basalis. Let's move on. Now, what is a placental barrier now? What do you mean by that? The placental barrier, okay, is, is a, is a membrane-like structure, okay, which is comprises of cytotrophoblast, syncytiotrophoblast, a basement membrane, and fetal capillary endothelium. So cytotrophoblast, syncytiotrophoblast, a basement membrane, and fetal capillary endothelium. Okay, now see here, the cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast are the parts of trophoblast. We all know that. They are the actually parts of blastocyst, you can say, but the outermost covering of the blastocyst is called trophoblast, and the trophoblast has got two layers. The outer is syncytiotrophoblast, and inner is cytotrophoblast. Now, basement membrane and fetal capillary endothelium also uh, forms a part of placental barrier. Now, why the term barrier is given there? Because it doesn't allow everything to pass towards the baby. Okay, it doesn't allow everything to pass towards the baby. It will it will only allow those things, okay, which are beneficial to the baby. But that is not always true. Sometimes some of the drugs can cross the placenta very easily if the mother have 
has taken those type of drugs. That's why we keep on saying, do not prescribe any unnecessary drug or medicine during pregnancy because they can be teratogenic or they may do harm to the baby. This is the concept of placental barrier. Now, okay, let's move on. Placenta is a flattened, discoid mass of the tissue. It looks quite rounded. Discoid is a disc shape. Okay, disc shape structure is quite flattened structure, which is attached to the uterine wall. Okay. It's attached to the uterine wall and it establishes the connection between mother and fetus through the umbilical cord. So please, uh, guys, mute yourself. I can clearly see three of the guys have not muted themselves. Okay, please do that. Now, share. So it attaches to the uterine wall on one side, okay, and the baby to the other. And now, the important point here where is the location of the placenta? Now, let me talk about this with the help of a diagram. Let, let me complete this first. The normal location of the placenta is upper uterine segment, which is near the fundus. It's always normal there. If the placenta is located on the lower uterine segment, this is always abnormal. Okay, It is a complicated thing because there is a cervix there in the lower part of the uterus. And through the cervix, baby has to come out. If the placenta is located there, then it may obstruct. Okay the delivery process so it is always abnormal and that condition is known as any student can tell me what is that condition called when you try previa placenta previa sir placenta e previa exactly many placenta previa excellent placenta previa okay we'll talk about that don't worry because these are the special term which you have to know from now onwards so let me revise again placenta is normally present in the upper uterine segment that is near the fundus okay, or the body. But if the same placenta is located in the lower uterine segment near the cervix, it is always abnormal and that is called placenta previa. Now, development, so many times we talked about, it has got two sources, maternal sources from decidua, or you can clearly say decidua basalis, and fetal sources from chorionic frondosum. Okay, or chorionic frondosum, or you can simply call it chorion frondosum as well. Now, see here. What is this upper uterine segment? And what is the lower uterine segment? And what is placenta previa? Now, let's see with the help of this picture. Now, this is the uterus, and this is the uterine cavity where a baby is developing. Okay, the baby is developing here. Now, here is the placenta. This is structure is the placenta. And see here, this is the fundus. This is fundus of the placenta. The middle part is the body. And here is the cervix. So this placenta is clearly attached near the fundic area as well as in the body. So this is normal. It is not blocking. It is not blocking the cervix. Now, whereas in this picture, look at this placenta. It is not touching the fundic area. Okay, it is mainly in the body and also the lower part of the body. On the other hand, it is still coming downwards and blocking the cervical opening. That means internal os of the cervix. Cervix has two openings: internal os and external os. So this is the internal os we are talking about, and this one is even more complicated. See here, it has completely okay block the internal os this type of location of placenta is called placenta previa so this is quite a dangerous type of placental insertion because the baby cannot descend down number one and because of the vigorous uterine contraction this placenta may separate quite early from the uterine wall and that may uh, cause decreased blood flow towards the baby. That can also happen. Now, okay, so let's move further. These are the different points. 
this is a bit of revision slide once again see here so this is the placenta this is the maternal component known as decidua basalis there is a chorion frondosum which forms the fetal component of the placenta now as a little bit you know detail about decidua here okay in some of the textbook some of the textbook they have mentioned there are three parts of the decidua one is decidua basalis okay decidua basalis another is called decidua capsularis decidua capsularis and third is called decidua parietalis decidua parietalis share so decidua basalis decidua capsularis and decidua parietalis among them decidua basalis is the most important structure because this is present right here this is decidua basalis okay decidua capsularis is present near to this this fetal component and parietalis is another rest of the part now that's the development of the placenta we are talking about now how the full term placenta looks like means when the placenta is fully developed okay after the delivery of the baby placenta would also come out in the third stage of the labor placenta is delivered so when we examine that placenta how it looks like let's talk about this at full term okay at full term the placenta is a disc shape which is called discoid with a diameter of 15 to 25 centimeter so this is a quite a big size 15 to 25 centimeter okay a rounded structure and it is approximately 3 centimeter thick it it weigh about 500 to 600 gram these are not very important points for you nobody is going to ask these okay these measurements here but roughly we should know how big is the placenta now at birth okay after the delivery of the baby this placenta should also come out until and unless placenta is delivered you know the labor is not complete so this happens in third stage of the labor the placenta is delivered now how it is delivered it is getting separated from the uterine wall because of constant contraction of the uterine wall the placenta is torn from the uterine wall and around 30 minutes after the birth of the baby this placenta is expelled from the uterine cavity and this is called third stage of the labor later on i'll i'll teach everything about the different stages of the labor but remember from right now third stage of the labor is all about placental delivery or placental expulsion now let's let's view that placenta from maternal side and the fetal side okay. what are the structure present there in full term placenta now, after the birth when the placenta is viewed from the maternal side we can see around 15 to 20 slightly bulged area they are called cotyledons you have to remember this term cotyledons and this cotyledon is covered by a thin layer of decidua basalis which is clearly recognizable because this is decidua basalis which is forming the maternal part of the placenta so quite naturally a thin layer of decidua basalis is still exists there and on the on the other hand there are 15 to 20 slightly bulged area which are known as cotyledons now whereas the fetal surface of the placenta is covered entirely by the chorionic plate okay chorionic plate and that chorionic plate has got different membrane which are called chorion and amnion chorion and amnion they are called the membrane a number of large arteries and veins which are known as chorionic blood vessels okay they converge towards the umbilical cord and they form the umbilical vein so this is how uh, you know uh, the chorionic vessels form the umbilical vein and they travel into the umbilical cord so these are some of the important structural detail of placenta at the time of delivery
now let's see at this picture okay what i was talking everything is here in this diagram you see this this is the fetal side okay this is the fetal side of the placenta so what we are talking about now is look at this chorionic plate this is called chorionic plate umbilical cord is attached there and this one membrane the outer membrane is called amnion okay and you can see the chorionic blood vessels right from the surface these chorionic blood vessels will converge together and they travel into the umbilical cord now this is the real placenta this is a schematic diagram but this is a real placenta you see this these are the chorionic blood vessels okay and you can clearly see the attachment of the umbilical cord here this is the umbilical cord attachment and these are the different uh, chorionic blood vessels and this membrane which is separated is called amnion now how how it looks when we uh, examine it from the maternal side now see here this is the maternal side a small layer of decidua basalis is still there when we remove that decidua basalis then underlying are the cotyledons okay around 15 to 20 cotyledons are there they look like a bulge pieces now see that when we remove this decidua we can see these cotyledons okay bulge pieces now we know the structure of placenta now before we move on to the functions of the placenta okay just quickly have a look at this picture so all of you please focus on your screen now so this is the most important functions of the placenta because of this function of the placenta the baby is surviving there okay now see this there is the baby okay this is the placenta so waste product from the baby is going towards the placenta isn't it going towards the placenta oxygen from the placenta will go to the baby carbon dioxide from the baby is coming towards the placenta nutrients from the placenta going towards the baby and again the waste product is coming from the baby now when we talk about placenta this is the maternal circulation we are talking about okay because the blood from the mother coming to placenta first it will fill those chorionic villi and those spaces intervillous space and then that blood will diffuse into the fetal blood vessels and then only it will go there and through that placental barrier which we talked about okay this exchange occurs between the fetal circulation and the maternal circulation this is a very important point to understand now you can see different color there okay different color blood vessels you can see the blood vessels which are shown in red have high oxygen content okay purple has medium oxygen content and the blue have very low oxygen content so this is very important point to understand now let's move on okay now with this knowledge let's talk about what are the functions of placenta see here the first of them and the most important is transport function this is the job of placenta this is the most important function of placenta so placenta transfers nutrients and waste product between the mother and the fetus now see here between the mother and the fetus okay let me uh, underline and uh, explain some important point okay let's take time there's no hurry the first is respiratory function that is exchange of the gases okay and they are oxygen and carbon dioxide now that exchange is accomplished by simple diffusion process now, how much oxygen at term the fetus extracts about 20 to 30 ml of oxygen per minute from the maternal circulation so this is what happens okay and this has to be the continuous process because 
even for a few minutes okay uh, if interruption of the oxygen supply occurs to the fetus it would be fatal it is fatal to the fetus means the fetal heart rate okay will swing now the fetal heart rate in the beginning there is tachycardia but if hypoxia is prolonged then the same heart rate can become bradycardic and we call that fetal distress now if we do not you know uh, note that in time or if we do not detect that in time this baby may collapse or die inside the uterus so this is an important point now another function is the excretory function now those excreta okay are the waste product which is produced by the baby like urea uric acid okay, creatinine they all are okay uh, going towards the maternal circulation by simple diffusion again so this is excretory function and third is nutritive function so the nutrients from the maternal blood is okay, obtained by the baby again through placenta most important substance is glucose now these are some of the very very important transport function let's move on what is the second important functions for us now see here this is the picture the same same thing has been explained here once again this big rounded red structure is umbilical vein these two are umbilical arteries you see here oxygen nutrients and hormones are delivered to the baby through umbilical vein and waste and carbon dioxide are delivered from the baby to the placenta and then from the placenta to the maternal circulation by umbilical arteries so vein carries oxygenated blood arteries carries deoxygenated blood in case of umbilical cord and placenta now see here so this is the schematic diagram of baby which is developing inside the uterus and this picture is taken from here the second important functions of placenta is the endocrine function now we have already talked about this in our previous classes so every student know that you know if even if you do not know this is the time please revise yourself these are absolutely important knowledge for you these are the important hormones human chorionic gonadotropin hcg human placenta lactosin hpl progesterone and estrogen these are the four important hormone and can you add the last one which is not very important but nevertheless relaxation relaxation relax very relax good very good relaxation excellent okay relaxation can be considered as the another one it has important role near about the labor process now a bit of revision for you hcg or human chorionic gonadotropin it stimulate the production of progesterone stimulate the production of progesterone we all know that by the corpus luteum in the second half of the menstrual cycle okay after the ovulation corpus luteum is formed that corpus luteum has to be maintained in the early part of the pregnancy and that maintenance of the corpus luteum is done by hcg because corpus luteum is producing one important hormone which is progesterone and remember this progesterone is responsible for the deciduous reaction in endometrium and because of that deciduous reaction decidua basalis will be formed and that decidua basalis is a important part of placenta look at the relation here so without this hormone without the role of progesterone probably deciduous reaction can never occur now another important function or role of this hormone is this hormone is excreted by the mother in her urine and in the early stages of gestation its presence is an indicator of pregnancy and this is what we call it pregnancy test or urine pregnancy test okay beta hcg detection in the urine is the confirmation of pregnancy another important point here 
is human placenta lactosin. This is an important hormone, which is again coming out from the placenta. And uh, this induces lipolysis, okay, which elevate free fatty acid level in the mother. And this helps in milk production after the delivery of the baby during uh, pregnancy. You know, it may not be required, but after the pregnancy, milk should immediately come. So everything is getting ready for the appropriate time. Okay. I want you okay, to understand this lipolysis. This human placental lactosin okay, almost acts like a growth hormone. And growth hormone has a lipolysis function. So this is how we correlate and remember. Another point, it is also considered to be the growth hormone of the fetus. Okay. So fetus may grow in size uh, because of the placental lactosin. This is not the only hormone there, but it has a role. The third important hormone is progesterone. It maintains the endometrium during pregnancy. So many times I've described the deciduous reaction of the endometrium is done by progesterone and another hormone is estrogen. Now, can you tell me there are three structural type of estrogen out of that, which one is present during pregnancy? It's a triol. Estradiol. Estradiol. Wait, wait. Estradiol. Is it estradiol or estriol? E3. E3. Estradiol. Estradiol. Okay. Estradiol. Estradiol. Yeah. So, so okay. E wait, wait, wait. wait E3. Wait, E3, okay. So many students are answering very, I'm very impressed actually. You, you guys are taking a lot of interest, you know. This revision as these things can happen later. But this interest is what is such an important thing. Very good, okay. Now, please revise once again. Many students have answered wrongly here, okay. So do revision and we'll, we'll uh, uh, again discuss this towards the end. Yeah, because there's a bit of time left, so I, I will I will finish the remaining things first here. In the class break time, we can do that, and then uh, you know uh, make your concept quite clear. Now, another important function of placenta is the barrier function. You see there. So, what do you mean by this? I already told you. Everything cannot pass towards the baby from the mother. But there are certain things which has to pass, okay? So we want something to pass and we don't want other things to pass also. So let's talk about it now. Placenta is not a true barrier between a uh, mother and the fetus. Not a true barrier. It, it is like a semi-permeable barrier, you can say, because there are some substance which can pass through the placenta and others cannot. Now, what are those useful substances that pass through the placenta? They are gases, okay, carbon dioxide and oxygen, nutrients, okay, most important of them is glucose, waste product, urea, and maternal antibody. Never forget this, IgG, okay, you all know what are the types of antibody, IgA, IgM, IgG, IgD, and IgE, among them, IgG can very easily cross the placenta. This is such an important point, okay? We'll discuss this later. Now, there are certain harmful substances that can also cross the placenta. Not all harmful substances can cross the placenta, but there are certain things which can easily cross, okay? Like some infectious agent. And one of the important examples which we all the time take Okay, it's torch group of infection. Now, I have already, you know, uh, discussed the full form of torch in one of my previous class. So let me see how many of you can remember this. Can anyone tell me what is the full form of torch there? T means what? Uh, the the toxoplasmosis is the rubella cytomegalovirus. <laughs> okay, so see that answers are coming. Okay, and they are right also. So T and O belongs to toxoplasma, okay? R belongs to rubella. Rubella, rubella. very good. C belongs to? 
साइटोमेगालोवायरस सीएम भी सीएम भी साइटोमेगालोवायरस एच के हर्पिस के हर्पिस सिंप्लेक्स वायरस एंड एक्चुअली देर हैज टू बी टॉर्च ओके वन एस व्हिच इज मिस देयर द लास्ट वन एंड दैट इज सिफिलिस ओके नाउ लिसन केयरफुली समटाइम्स वी वी डोंट वी डोंट नीड टू राइट एस एट द एंड if you do not write s at the end now this o which comes after t we can write as others we can write as others and you can you can delete this syphilis during that time because there is no s now okay so in that others you can mention syphilis very confidently so anyway you can give your answer toxoplasma others include syphilis and even hiv there you can include even hiv there rubella cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex these are the parts of tors group of infection now some of the teratogenic drug like thalidomide and phenytoin so many other examples even vitamin e derivatives are the teratogenic drug anti cancer drug are teratogenic drug okay so uh, they can easily cross the placenta and can uh, uh, produce teratogenic effect to the baby if mother is consuming cocaine heroin even smoking even alcohol all of these can easily cross the placenta and can damage the baby okay so remember this important point now one small question before uh, you know this session would be over what is that teratogenic effect caused by thalidomide in the baby anybody it's called phocomelia okay phoco okay so let's continue we are talking about uh, placenta okay so there are some placental abnormalities which may exist during the pregnancy let's talk about what are those wait a little bit come on what are you talking about Now, I don't have any options but to mute all of you now because students are not listening some of them okay after some time I will I will redo again now so the point here is sometimes during some pregnancy there may be placental abnormalities which may exist now one of that is placenta previa the student already know what is this placenta previa is the insertion of placenta okay on the lower uterine segment or you can say attachment of the placenta on lower uterine segment this is considered abnormal there are different grades of placenta previa sometimes it is completely blocking the internal os okay sometimes it's just touching the internal os so accordingly different grades are there but the very important problem of placenta previa is it may it start to bleed okay before the time of delivery so it is one of the important cause of antepartum hemorrhage remember antepartum means before the birth okay so it is one of the important cause of hemorrhage or bleeding during third trimester before the birth placenta previa on the other hand abruptio placentae another important condition abruptio placentae let me you know discuss it here abruptio placenta is premature premature separation of placenta okay premature separation of placenta this is called abruptio placenta now see now what is the problem if placenta is prematurely separated before the time of delivery of the baby what will happen okay so let me unmute you now and ask this question okay one minute okay the same question i'll repeat again what will happen if the placenta separates prematurely what's what happened to the baby sir due to abortion miscarriage abortion miscarriage abortion is due to this bleeding sir Miscarriage due to extreme bleeding. 
excessive bleed is going to be very big okay very good sir, so sir, due to, due to huh? decrease level of progesterone maybe my um, my the contraction of endometrium increase and lead to effective placenta okay so listen here okay the students are answering a different type of answers are coming here now see here we all know the functions of placenta placenta should only deliver after the baby comes out that is during the third stage of labor the delivery of the baby occurs during second stage of labor okay then only the placenta should come out but here in this condition placenta is getting separated even before the delivery of the baby probably during third trimester which is absolutely wrong thing to happen okay now my question is what will happen to the baby if placenta prematurely separate the placenta is the organ which is okay giving blood to the baby let's talk like that which is giving oxygen to the baby which is giving nutrients to the baby if that placenta is prematurely separated okay from the uterine wall the baby may die number 1 okay number 2 there is a massive amount of blood clot which is you know collected in between the placenta and the uterine wall okay and that blood may come out also that blood clot may give compression to the baby so many different things can happen so this is abruptio placentae let's move on according to the depth of a penetration okay according to the depth of penetration there are three important abnormalities of the placenta now placenta the maternal part of the placenta is formed by decidua basalis okay and decidua basalis is a part of endometrium myometrium doesn't contribute to any part of the placenta but in this condition in this abnormal type of placenta there is invasion of the myometrium from see here invasion of the myometrium means it has gone very deep it has gone so deep that it has infiltrated the muscle okay myometrium is the muscle wall of our uterine cavity so this is called placenta accreta there is a invasion of the myometrium and that invasion doesn't penetrate the entire thickness of the muscle it is just probably infiltrating okay or invading a small amount of the myometrium that is placenta accreta now placenta increta means when the placenta further extends into the myometrium penetrating the muscle but still not completely okay probably half or even more than half so this is placenta increta and placenta percreta per means through and through you remember like that through and through so placenta penetrate the entire myometrium up to the uterine serosa which is the outermost layer okay and it invades through the entire uterine wall that is called percreta so accreta just invading the myometrium increta a significant thickness of the myometrium is invaded and percreta the whole thickness of the myometrium is invaded so that it has reached the uterine serosa on the outer side now sometimes in extremes of the cases what can happen the placenta is attaching to the other organ such as rectum or even urinary bladder now these are the extreme cases but that can happen in case of placenta percreta so remember this favorite questions of the examiner accreta increta and percreta these are the abnormality according to the depth of penetration of the placenta okay let's move on now another type of another type of abnormalities okay of the placenta is placenta succion curiata we'll talk about that a little bit later let let us uh, see this picture immediately so that we 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 can remember it for a long time see here all of you please focus on the screen so this is the normal thing isn't it this is the decidua okay stratum basalis of endometrium and myometrium is here okay so this is the normal thing it is not invaded any myometrium this is the accreta this is invading the myometrium a little bit this is the most common variety okay accreta 
in Krita, it has gone probably half of the myometrium. And per Krita now, see that the whole thickness of the myometrium is invaded or infiltrated and it is even going outside the uh, myometrium. It is even involved in serosal layer or very, very rarely it can involve other intra-abdominal organs as well. Now, one question to you. So what is the problem of this type of okay, placenta? What can happen to, to the mother or after the delivery? What can happen? Anybody? Excessive bleeding, sir. Yeah, but it's still difficult, sir. And maybe that hemorrhage. Somebody told me there is excessive bleeding or, yes. or hemorrhage. Absolutely yes. correct. You're absolutely right. Yes. Now you should understand why that happens, okay? So let me explain this. Whenever a piece of placenta is left behind inside the uterus or in the uterine wall, that uterus cannot contract properly. It cannot contract properly because of that left piece of the placenta. And if it cannot contract properly after the delivery of the baby, okay, this is the way by which bleeding stops by contraction of the placenta. If placenta is not contracting, bleeding will continue. Bleeding will continue. It results in severe type of postpartum hemorrhage, which is also known as PPH. So this is the important point. And many of these placenta, we cannot remove them. Okay. Uh, for example, inside the delivery room, we need to take them for surgery because they're invading deeper into the myometrium. So surgical procedures has to be done to remove these, these pieces of placenta. This is the important knowledge. Let's move on. Now, another important abnormality, which I took the name before I again discuss those things, is suction suriate lobe, also known as placenta suction suriata. Suction suriate lobe or placenta suction suriata. Now, what do you mean by that? Listen carefully. Sometimes there is a small accessory lobe. Okay. Sometimes there is a small accessory lobe of the placenta which may develop in the membrane. Those are these are developed in the membrane, like amnion or chorion. And this development occurs from a you know at a distance from the peripheral margin of the placenta. And they are attached to a blood vessel. And that blood vessel is usually a fetal in origin. Now, let me highlight the important point immediately. So this is a small accessory lobe of the placenta, which is developing at a distance from the periphery of the placenta. And they are developed it's usually inside the membrane, like amnion or chorion, and they have a vascular connection. And that vascular connection is mainly fetal in origin. Now. The incidence is around 5%. And look at the clinical importance of this. It may get retained inside the uterus after the delivery of the baby or after the delivery of the placenta because this one piece of the placenta is not in contact with the main placenta. It is a little bit far away from the main placenta. So it can be easily left inside the uterine cavity and I just now told you, whenever a piece of placenta is left inside, it can lead to serious hemorrhage because the placenta will be flaccid. It cannot contract properly. So placenta suction chureta is an important cause of postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, And you need to explore later on. Is there some piece which is left behind? And we will be happy if we find that piece inside the uterine cavity somewhere. Now see here, this is a schematic diagram which will make you understand in a very easy way. Now see this, this is the main placenta here. Okay, so let me use the pointer and show you. So this is the main placenta here. So this is the umbilical cord and these are called chorionic vessels. Now look at this one piece. 
which is a bit far away from the main placenta and it is attached by the blood vessel. So this is called succinctureate lobe. It can easily be left over uh, inside the uh, uterine cavity after the delivery of the baby or after the delivery of the main placenta and it can lead to postpartum hemorrhage. Now with this, let us move on to the some other related topics of placenta that is amniotic fluid and umbilical cord. Okay, so let's deal with this. Now, amniotic fluid, it is filling the amniotic cavity. We all know the amniotic cavity, okay? The baby is surrounded by the amniotic fluid and the baby is lying inside the amniotic cavity and the outer covering is by amnion and the chorion. So this is the amniotic cavity. So this amniotic cavity is filled with a clear watery fluid that is called amniotic fluid. Now, how this amniotic fluid is formed? The mainly, okay, it is derived from the maternal blood, okay, but part of that is formed by amniotic cells or amnion as well. So it is, a, you can say, ultra filtrate of the maternal blood and part of it from the amniotic cells. One important point is even fetal urine okay, plays an important role in the composition of amniotic fluid. Fetal urine and fetal daily urine output. See there, the fetal dairy daily urine output at term is about 400 to 1200 ml. And fetus swallow about 200 to 500 ml of liquor liquor means amniotic fluid every day at term. Now let me explain this again so that you can understand. Amniotic fluid okay, is mainly derived from the maternal blood. It is in part formed by the amniotic cells and fetal urine is also important part of this, okay, constituent or composition of this. The amount of urine which is uh, produced by the baby per day, okay, inside the uterus is 400 to 1200 ml near to the term and the fetus swallow about 200 to 500 ml of liquor every day at the term. This swallowing of the amniotic fluid is very very important for the lung development. If you remember we talked about this in our last semester when I talk uh, uh, respiratory system or even renal system. Okay, The amniotic fluid or the presence of amniotic fluid is absolutely necessary for the development of the lung. If amniotic fluid is not there inside the lung, the lung cannot stretch properly and there is underdevelopment of the lung, which is known as pulmonary hypoplasia. So this is the important point in connection with amniotic fluid. Now see here, the circulation of amniotic fluid, let's talk about it. It is replaced every three hour replace every three hours so the it, it forms there rapidly regarding the volume the amount of fluid increases from approximately 30 ml at 10 weeks of gestation to 450 ml at 20 weeks and it reaches about one liter at term that is at 37 week so one liter at term 30 ml at 10 week of gestation and around 450 ml to 500 ml at 20 weeks so easy, easy to remember, see that 20 weeks, around you know halfway of the pregnancy, 450 ml to 500 ml, and in the full term, about one liter. In post-dated pregnancy, now this is important point. In post-dated pregnancy, it is decreased to 200 ml at 43 week of the gestation. Now what is post-dated pregnancy? Anybody? There is a post term pregnancy. Post term, sir. Okay. Now, now a small, small, you know, clarification I like to give you. There is a small difference between post dated and post term. Date means 40 weeks of gestation. Okay. If the lady doesn't deliver till 40 weeks, we call it post-dated pregnancy. 
but post term pregnancy is after 42 week so post dated after 40 week post term after 42 week both are not good because the amount of amniotic fluid is rapidly decreased after it reaches 40 week so see that at 43 week from 1000 ml at 37 it suddenly drops to 200 ml and without amniotic fluid you know there is constant compression of the baby the uterine muscles are con constantly contracting so they may compress the baby all the time this is not a good condition to have now, color of the amniotic fluid is watery it is watery in color and at term it is pale yellow okay or turbid probably because of the decrease in volume now there are certain abnormal colors of the amniotic fluid one is green okay another is golden another is dark and another is dark brown now let's see, let's talk about in which situation these colors are there the green one is the most important among all is meconium stained amniotic fluid okay now this meconium is yes let me ask this question what is meconium the meconium is the first excretion of the uterus okay that is the first excretion of the uterus exactly okay both irfan and uzair they are answering very correctly you can say this is the first intestinal discharge or excretion from the baby first intestinal excretion or discharge from the baby is called meconium now you may be wondering why meconium is passed inside the uterus now remember normally it should not be passed in cephalic presentation in breech presentation it may be passed that is altogether very different type of point majority of the babies they, they are born with cephalic presentation so let's talk about this now in cephalic presentation meconium should not be passed inside the uterus if it is passed it means there is fetal distress there is fetal distress either the heart rate of the baby is more or less than the normal and fetal distress is a feature of fetal hypoxia okay so in case of fetal hypoxia condition meconium is passed inside the uterus now listen very carefully the lady has come okay in the hospital with labor pain you have done artificial rupture of the membrane you want to see what is the color of the amniotic fluid and you, you see the amniotic fluid is very thick okay and green in color very thick and green in color this is an emergency situation now because the baby is having hypoxic distress and we have to deliver this baby as soon as possible and only one way is there that is cesarean section there is no other way i have to deliver the baby quickly by cesarean section so this is importance of meconium stained amniotic fluid this is never normal golden color of the amniotic fluid occurs in rh incompatibility due to fetal rbc hemolysis now rh incom incompatibility is a is an example of hemolytic anemia if mother is rh negative and baby or fetus is rh positive especially in second pregnancy onward there is high chance of rh incompatibility that means hemolysis in the fetus and, and and because of that you know bilirubin the amniotic fluid may become golden yellow dark color is in concealed aph aph means anti partum hemorrhage okay let me write that for you anti partum hemorrhage anti partum now anti partum hemorrhage means just before the birth during third trimester if hemorrhage occur and the commonest two causes for antepartum hemorrhages are placenta previa and abruptus placentae dark brown okay occurs in intrauterine death it almost looks like a tobacco juice in appearance this is intrauterine death or still birth baby so these are some of the important points regarding the color of the amniotic fluid now what are the functions of amniotic fluid it acts like a shock absorber 
means it absorbs jolts and it is somewhat protective for the baby. It prevents adherence of the embryo to the amnion. Okay. It allows for fetal movements. This is another important function. We, we say the fetus is swimming inside the amniotic fluid. Okay. It is swimming all the time. And during labor, it helps to dilate the cervix and flush out birth candle. So even dilatation of the cervix okay, uh, is done by amniotic fluid. But the two important functions are shock absorbing function and it, it allows for proper fetal movements. Now, let's talk about some of the abnormality of amniotic fluid. If amniotic fluid volume is excessive, what we call that. If it is very less, what we call that. And what are the conditions which produce that, okay? Let's discuss about this. Now, if amniotic fluid is excessive, we call it hydramnios or polyhydramnios. It's the same thing. In some of the textbook, it is mentioned as hydramnios, in some other polyhydramnios. Now, it is the term which is used to describe an excessive of amniotic fluid around 1500 to 2000 ml. 1500 to 2000 ml. So, this is high amount of amniotic fluid. Share. So, oligohydramnios, on the other hand, refers to very decreased amount of amniotic fluid less than 400 ml at term pregnancy 400 ml is way too less now, both conditions are associated with an increase in the incidence of birth defect now what are those birth defect which are associated with hydramnios or oligohydramnios okay let's talk about it and some of them you have already heard or you already know now see here all of you please focus on the screen. These are the causes of hydramnios or polyhydramnios. In almost 35% of the cases, okay, we don't know that's idiopathic. Okay, they simply uh, overproduction of amniotic fluid maybe. In some other 25% of the cases, maternal diabetes may be responsible. Now, maternal diabetes okay, are of two types. One is called gestational diabetes, which is developed during this pregnancy. That mother was never diabetic before the pregnancy. The, the diabetes just developed during this pregnancy. This is called gestational diabetes. And the second one, she is diabetic from before. Okay, this is called chronic diabetes. So there are two types. Another one is congenital malformation. That's what the question will be asked to the student. Now, see, see here. Central nervous system disorders like anencephaly. Now, what is anencephaly? What is anencephaly? anencephaly? In the absence of a major portion of the brain, skull, and skull that occurs during embryonic development, sir. Okay. Okay. Any other student? Good. Good answer. Any other? When the brain is not completely formed, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Sir, anencephaly is the cranial neuro Sir, anencephaly is the cranial that manifests with absent uh, underdevelopment of the cranial cortex or cerebellum. Okay. Now see that all the students have answered it very correctly. Okay. Now uh, listen, everyone. Anencephaly is lack of development of the brain, along with the covering of the brain as well. Both. The covering of the brain as well as the brain itself fails to develop. This is called anencephaly. I'm making it very easy for you. Anencephaly, okay? Now, this anencephaly is a very, very little type of congenital malformation. This baby will survive only for a few hours probably because the brain stem is still intact and life is possible for a few hours with brain stem only. But the whole other cerebral hemisphere and most part of the other brain is absent there. So uh, we cannot do anything, okay? So this, this is called lethal congenital malformation. Gastrointestinal defect, like atresia, esophageal atresia, duodenal atresia, okay? These are the different example. They can prevent the infant from swallowing the fluid, which results in hydramnios or polyhydramnios. So easily, you can remember anencephaly, 
esophageal atresia and duodenal atresia for the causes. Now, on the other hand, what are the causes of oligohydramnios? Now, these are even easier for us to remember. Renal agenesis. When kidneys are not developed, there is no production of the urine. And I already told you, urine is one of the important component of amniotic fluid. So without urine, okay, the amount is quite less. Another is premature rupture of the amnion. Now in this situation, the amniotic fluid is getting lost quite early. So it is getting leaked outside. So again, the volume would be less. So this is how we give explanation. Now, after this, the last part of the topic is umbilical cord. So let's talk about it. Now, uh, a bit of anatomy, every student know. Okay. The umbilical cord is developed from the connecting stock. It's a part of the embryo, the connecting stock. And at birth, the umbilical cord is approximately two centimeter in diameter and around 50 to 60 uh, centimeter long. It is quite a long uh, tubular structure okay long tubular structure it's here 50 to 60 centimeter long it is tortuous which is causing false knot these are not the true knot okay these are false knot and it is not that damaging for the baby okay true knot can happen around the neck of the fetus and that uh, you know uh, can even hamper the delivery of the baby we'll talk about that later now, what are the components of umbilical cord? What structures are present inside them? Very, very important question. Now, normally there are two arteries and one vein inside the umbilical cord. And in the middle part of the umbilical cord, as a supporting structure, there is Wharton's jelly. This Wharton's jelly act like a supporting structure there inside the umbilical cord. So two arteries, one vein with Warden's jelly. Now sometimes around in one in 200 newborn, there is only one umbilical artery present, another is absent. And we call that single umbilical artery, which is a marker of congenital anomaly that is present inside the baby. Let me repeat again. If only one umbilical artery is present in that baby, this is a marker of significant congenital abnormality inside the baby. Now we need to find what are those uh, uh, congenital anomaly. It may be in the heart, it may be inside the kidney, it may be inside the genitalia, or it may be in some other parts of the body. So a good investigation is necessary in this type of babies. Now, look at this picture here. See there, where is the connecting stock? You need to find it because from the connecting stock, the umbilical cord is going to be developed. And let's uh, take a bit of opportunity to, to see this embryological picture. Okay. Here, this is the area okay, which is the connecting stock, this one because here is the embryo this is called embryo okay this this is embryo this is the main part of the embryo actually this this part you all know that in the beginning there is bilaminar germ disk then it will uh, convert into trilaminar germ disk and from there the embryogenesis start okay this is definitive yolk sac this is called coronary cavity and everything and see there it is implanted on the uh, endometrium, okay, which will convert into decidua because of the effect of progesterone. Look at these empty spaces, okay. These are filled with the blood vessels, and this blood comes from the mother side, okay. Then it is collected by the uh, fetal blood vessels, and then it will be taken towards the developing baby. See that here, here the baby will develop, okay. So uh, these are the important point. Now we have uh, come uh, towards the end, okay? 
look at this uh, uh, picture or slide. Let me explain this again. Here is amnion. This is the amniotic cavity which you are talking about. This is the embryo which is developing here. See there? This is the developing embryo. This is the amniotic cavity surrounded by the amnion. This is a connecting stock and it is a future umbilical cord. It is developing into the umbilical cord. It's connecting stock will develop into umbilical cord. I am repeating this so that you can remember. Now there is Wharton's jelly inside the umbilical cord. There are two, two arteries and one vein. These are some of the important points. Now let me utilize this moment and talk about some clinical aspect here. During delivery, during delivery, sometimes what happens, the umbilical cord comes out before the head of the baby. Now, do you think this is a good condition? Who can answer this? No, sir. Why? Why no? Why no? Because there is increased increase chances of uh, uh, placenta rupture before uh, delivery. Because uh, when uh, baby push downward. Okay. Okay. So I got I got your I got your answer. Okay. So this this may be a, a bit a difficult question for many of the students. So let me explain this. Now sometimes what happens before okay before the head comes out before the head comes out sometimes the umbilical cord would prolapse. This is absolutely lethal situation because the head is a very you know a tough you know part of the baby's body isn't it it will it will give compression to that umbilical cord and remember the baby is not yet delivered it is still getting supply from the placenta okay so the baby may become hypoxic because of the compression of the umbilical vessels and that baby may die first thing second one okay sometimes what happens the umbilical cord is quite long that umbilical cord may form okay, some knot around the neck of the baby. Now see there, baby is trying to come out. The mother is constantly pushing the uh, uh, uterine contraction is happening. But because of the tight you know, knot formed around the neck of the baby by the umbilical cord, the baby cannot descend downward. This is a very serious situation. So a good midwife or the nurse or even the doctor should identify that situation quickly and they have to they have to you know take that knot out with their hand and then delivery can occur very easily another point if that umbilical cord is damaged or ruptured or cut before the baby is born another big problem occurs this can lead to blood loss from the baby's side and quickly baby can develop hypovolemia. So these are some of the very important applied, you know, aspect of umbilical cord. So with this, okay, let me stop here for today.